Yeah, we had Prince Prince Harry was was in there, and then randomly we ended up in some bar at the top of Arc de Triomphe. I don't even know what it's called. Um, I think he ended up giving Toby Flood a love bite at one point. Honestly, <laughs> that. <laughs> imagine trying to imagine trying to explain that one to his to his girlfriend. It's Prince Harry that gave me. Yeah. Um, oh, Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload with Ryan Wilson and Max Leaf, who are going to help us deconstruct another crazy weekend of international rugby <laughs> where both England and Wales were rather embarrassed at home. We'll also be joined by ex-England international Matthew Tate to get his views on the downfall as well. But um, Firstly, more importantly than any of the rugby, we sadly lost a legend over the weekend in Doddy Weir, the ex-Scottish international and British and Irish line who'd been uh, battling uh, motor neuron disease and had raised over £8 million for charity since his diagnosis. Ryan, you would have known him. Just tell us how special a man he was. Oh, boys, he was he was one of those blokes, literally. You know, people talk about it. You know, a good guy that walks in the room and he lights up the room. He genuinely was. And, like, people were just... He was infectious. He was a legend of a bloke, always up for a good laugh. Um, I've got some good stories about him, like after Scotland games and stuff. He ran a lot of the sweets. Um, so you'd go up in your kit afterwards, and Gregor Townsend would have told us we weren't allowed a beer, but he'd be there waiting on stage with a pint. And he'd be like, Right, see it off, boys. <laughs> Dolly, they, well, and he did what Dolly said, see it off. Another pint would come up, he's still in your boots. Do you know what I mean? And then he'd have you singing a song on stage. Um, but he honestly was just one of those people, you know, that people absolutely love. So, yeah, such a shame. But what an amazing job he's done for, like, all the stuff around MND and even, the, you know, the way that he was battling with it to be so positive with everything. And, yeah, it was an honour to have uh, known him, actually, and, and got to spend a little bit of time with him. And I suppose the best way to um, to sort of, you know, push it on for him is make sure we do everything we can for MND and all the all the work that he's done with Doddy Aid, etc. So, yeah, here's one to to the big man Doddy, but rest in peace, big fella, um, fucking that legend of a bloke. Look at the rugby starting in Cardiff because what merely seven days after a rather humiliating home defeat against Georgia uh, that Mystic Max said he would have called if he'd bothered to come on the pod. Uh, Wales were cruising to victory with a 34-13 lead after 58 minutes, and then it all seemed to unravel. Uh, right, took to, <laughs> let, let's talk through the craziness more of the last 20 minutes. You know, Wallaby scoring 26 unanswered points. I actually forgot about that. They lost to Georgia last week, didn't they? Oh my we called God. it. Though. We did call it though. We did call this right. We, we did, did call it. Oh no, no, I'm not. I'm, but I think it's the way that they lost, which makes it even, even worse. worse. 32 yeah. odd, 13 up or something like that. Yeah. And they absolutely capitulated. Um, let's get his name right. Now, Wanga Nitawase has absolutely torn him a new one, to be fair. Um, if Australia didn't have him, then it might have been a different story. But they've absolutely bombed that, boys. And uh, that's a shocking loss for them. They're under the pump now. I, Max, I know you've seen the highlights. Um You've seen how the fella tore up. He's outstanding, wasn't he? Yeah, he's um, yeah, he runs like a greasy rhino, doesn't he? Elusive, feet like a tap dancing centipede. But he's got like enough, enough up top to sort of ride the challenges. But yeah, he was all over the shop. You Big turning his... point. Sorry, go on. You could see he was going for those sneaky picks as well. But yeah, Fuck, he was on fire, absolute fire. But how have they? How have they done that? I mean. <sighs> Especially at home with the Australians who haven't been amazing, who are missing a hell of a lot of players. That's all the talk all week was with, you know, how how many players they've been injured and, and they were missing so many players because they played a lot of rugby. I saw a stat the other day of how much rugby the Aussies have played over the last six months and it's absolute madness. And you can tell why they've probably got a lot of injuries. But fucking hell, the Welsh have really bombed that one there. Um, you feel for some of the guys, but fair play to the Aussies pulling it back. And the funny thing is it's friends against our... So Dave Rennie was our head coach and the forwards coach for um, for Wales is John Humphreys. And those two go at each other like you wouldn't <laughs> believe. Like, I know they've got a WhatsApp group where they get cracked into each other. So I think they were giving each other a bit of shit from last week. And then this week they'll be tearing into each other again. But yeah, outstanding by the Aussies to pull it back. But 
probably, I'd probably say it was more disappointing for the Welsh to lose it than Aussies. Yeah, from the Aussies winning. Yeah. Although they kind of deserved, I thought, I thought Australia have been, I know they've been oh. losing, but they sort of, they've just been like, they just look like a team like growing, like trying really hard. And like Dave Rennie's obviously chopped and changed a lot and they've been battling that. And then the injuries on top of that. So it's just like, it just goes to show that maybe the depth we thought that Australia didn't have now is there. You know what I mean? When when everyone gets bit, when they can pick everyone, they should be a formidable team coming into the World Cup. So I think he's prepared them well. Maybe they were, the, the architect had a plan and all this. But yeah, Wales, Wales, um, Wales had the the stalwarts, the 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 immortals. They were in the first half doing a job. Toby Fallatau going over, Alan and Jones throwing offloads. Obviously, Jack Morgan doing bits, and we got to see um Tim Rick with the yellow card. Cheeky, cheeky trip, mate. I've never fought a trip in someone, but to be fair, in that in that scenario, you actually might kick it out. Yeah, but. Fuck, that's big in the game. That's oh, no, that's it's massive. Turning point. It's that like, is a massive turning point. From was he? Oh no, was he? Would he have been skipper or was Win Jones skipper? I know that Tipper was skipper for the first few games. Was, <laughs> was skipper? skipper yeah, Tipper was captain. Yeah, yeah, he was from your skipper. Yeah, to, it's not good. It's not good. Sometimes it's just yeah. too tempting, though. Oh, just it's so tempting. Yeah. Oh. And would I'm Pete? Sorry to that. I didn't really see him like that. Who Tipper? Is he, that, is he that kind of guy? Nah, he's not. Do you know a funny story about him? You know, he, obviously you can see his hair now, but I always thought he was bald. Yeah. Because he have never I, seen him that scrum out. I've never yeah, seen him no. that bloody yeah. blue scrum out. And I went in to swap my jersey with him after, I think it was my first game for Scotland. I went to swap one of my jerseys. I go in there and I was like, I've never seen um, Tipperick. And he was, I thought, fuck, I don't even know who he is. I've looked, at, he's there. He's, he had hair. And I was like, why has he got hair? I thought he's bald. I don't know why. You didn't even recognise him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, cheeky from him. And uh, you can't get away with anything like that anymore. Back in the day, no one would have seen that, would they? Nah, well, yeah. I don't know. That was bad. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that obvious. It was It was quite slight. Very subtle. Until it yeah. wasn't, yeah. I think Pistol Pete wouldn't have known what happened. He would have thought, oh, I don't know, I've just tripped over something. Yeah. So sneaky. That's you know, sadly for, for Wayne Pivak, he's got well, bluntly a pretty shocking record. They've lost 75% of their matches this year, <clears throat> home defeats to Georgia and Italy. Uh, he said he's not going anywhere. The R- WRU are conducting a review, and we've got Welsh demigod Warren Gatland lurking at the stadium. He was there over the weekend. Yeah, you know, do we think it's time to give a short term contract to the most popular Kiwi in Wales? Are we no, Sean Edwards all day. All day. But oh, we've said this. Uh, we've said this last week. Is Sean I know. He's going to turn it. down a World Cup. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. He's going to the World Cup. Yeah, get, 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 yeah, get Big Wazza in there then. Do you reckon? Do you reckon he keeps like Alan Wynne Jones in that? Mate, year? I reckon he's like Mourinho, like of Chelsea, but before he went bad. Yeah, he's that. He's like the Godfather. He's the Teflon Don. Bloke's got keys to the country. He can do whatever he wants. Well, there and are. there's no expectation as well now. So actually, exactly. anything would do. Well, yeah. I, oh, I, just, yeah I wouldn't be surprised if it happens, but it would also be kind of dark as well. But I wouldn't be surprised well, if it happens. I like Wayne Peavert, though. I like, again, I like him. And I've heard good things about him as a coach. Like, I, I know quite a few of the boys that played under... <laughs> Him at Lenethley. Um, and I've heard he's a good bloke and he loves to piss. So I don't want him to go. <laughs> but honestly, a lot of the guys that have played under him, he, he seems like a good coach, but it's just it's, he just ain't getting it. They still play a lot of the old boys, though, eh? Like Ken Owens is still trucking it. Big Alan Wynne Jones. And I know you mentioned his one offload. Um, but you look at that and go, fuck, he's still, it, it's, is their depth good enough, Wales? Yeah, that's that's the question. Is now I'm going to reverse it with Pivac, where I did with Betty Jones. I'm going to be like, is the state of domestic Welsh rugby doing Pivac any favors? Did he get a poison chalice, a fake Mona Lisa? Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I know what you mean. 
We just got to throw some to throw some stuff out there, make the people think, critically think about PVAC's situation here. Um, a lot of injuries when he, there was a spell of injuries as well, so he couldn't pick everyone he wanted to. But yeah, is, is, the, is, the, is the club game in Wales letting PVAC's national side down? I don't think it's helping it. I don't think it's helping it. Who's under more pressure? Eddie or Wayne? Oh, uh, under more pressure? Due to the amount he gets paid, Eddie Jones, right? I'm, I, and I, like with all the talent and everything that's going on with the English system, I think he's under more pressure. But what am I thinking over here with Wayne? What am I thinking over here with Wayne? I think, I think Wayne's more sackable. Because <laughs> I think that they've got, Gatlin lurking and they're going to chuck him in there. Yes. What am I thinking, Max? Why do I think this? Why do I think that Eddie Jones should be doing better? He's got all the plays. It's, it's just like a bigger deal. But it's not because Welsh rugby is fucking huge. Look, this is Welsh over here. I, can't, I, can, I actually completely you know what I mean? get what you're, I completely get what you're saying, yeah. And like, wait, I don't know, I just feel like they're, they're, you, they're more likely to see Wayne Peebat. I suppose his the record's worse, isn't it, for Wales? The record, the record is worse. So yeah. the record is actually worse. And some of the teams that he's losing against, don't take it away from them. Italy and Georgia, they deserved it and were amazing. But they're two teams which are going, if England lost against those two teams, Eddie Jones is gone. Shoom, gone. So why not Wayne P back at Wales? That's, there we are. I've, of it than later. Yeah, I think you've 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 actually nailed that. Yeah, you've broken that down quite well. I think yeah. that might be the probably one of the best things I've ever seen on this fucking podcast. <laughs> well analyzed, well analyzed, sir. Well done. We are now delighted to be joined by Matthew Tate to get his thoughts on the England game and also to touch on his uh, incredible career as well. Matthew, you're you're out in Dubai with the seven starting in a in a couple of days. How how hectic have the preparations been? Yeah, no, very, very hectic to be honest. I started four weeks ago. Um, so it's very much in at the deep end as the uh, general start as the general manager and festival director out here. So there's there's plenty going on. There's a few snags to sort out today. Um on the stadia. But it's it's quite exciting. All the all the invitational teams, all the international teams are arriving, um, getting uh, posting themselves on social media, enjoying the delights of the Dubai. But chance to watch the Fijians sort of throwing the ball around and giggling to themselves this afternoon, which was quite, which was quite cool. Um, but it is a, a hectic week to say the least. So you're not on holiday then? No, I mean it does help that the weather is quite nice out here at this time of year. My wife's <laughs> back at home with our two boys. And it's absolutely hosing it down in the Midlands. And I'm sort of sat here and it's 32 during the day and low 20s probably overnight. And just quite just quite pleasant at this time of year. Sure. A lot of schmoozing to be done as well. You know, dinners out and taking people for drinks. You got you got that down now, down all right? Just about. Yeah, I did a bit of schmoozing actually before I before I started. I had a bit more time on my hands, but um I think uh, come Thursday, Friday, Saturday through the event, there's lots of uh corporate bits and pieces to be uh, to be taken care of my official duties well next year don't forget me max and mark will come over and host a couple bits for you <laughs> we're in we're in whatever you want to live show no way. Well, that's, that's, that's a deal provided you play in an invitational team as well we'll do that as well mark, <laughs> mark, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mark team manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm like water boy on the side <laughs> fine <laughs> uh isn't is haskell on the decks this year Haskell is on the deck, so we've got a beats on two stage, which is like a Balearic Ibiza style um, stage that overlooks pitch two. So we have our international invitational games uh, on that pitch, and he's up there doing his DJ piece. So it's normally oh. quite, a, uh, quite quite a good good party vibe up there. We can sing as well, can't we, Max? Oh no, you can. You can sing. No, 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 well. Max, 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 we're in there. We can sing as well, can't we, Max? Yeah, absolutely. I've got. I've got the baritone and um, yeah, Rai's got the more like singer songwriter vibes. I'm, I'm in. Yeah, let's do it. I'll bring the ukulele. It'll be a different Excellent. vibe, but it'll be nice. It'll be good. Yeah, yeah. It'll be like the wind down section. Yeah. Down. Sorted. Piss oh, off. Oh, I thought you were going to do the audition then. 
Right, just literally, I've just got my ukulele with me, actually. Hold and on just, <laughs> no, <laughs> go get the guitar. Uh, right. In, in any case, let's um, let's move on to what was from and probably an English fan's perspective a uh, pretty dire performance from England. But if you're a spring, you know, if you're a South Africa fan, it was a wonderful time for the Springboks. But uh, Matt, was it one of the worst performances you've seen under Eddie Jones? It was certainly frustrating. I think, to be honest, the whole the whole series has been quite frustrating. Um, we're kind of always waiting for this. We're developing players, and there's a little bit of grace because you know you see guys come through. Freddie Stewart came through. Your Jack Van Portfleet, but the performance is still out there, and the quality of the players we've got, and we see week in week out, people like Marcus Smith play amazingly for Harlequins, and we just don't then see that translated, apart from six minutes against New Zealand. And um, yeah, the, the South Africa game was just. I think you could probably excuse the defeats if it's high scoring and it's exciting and it's entertaining, but it just it just wasn't. <laughs> and I think that's part of the frustration of fans is that, and I guess from an RFU point of view, it becomes quite concerning when it doesn't feel like there's that connection between the fans and, and what's taking place on the pitch. And then that's not for lack of endeavour from the players, but it's, you know, as a supporter watching it and the South Africa went down to, lost a man after, after an hour and England couldn't capitalise on that, which is just really frustrating as a supporter. Ryan, from a neutral's point of view, what I mean, how do you see it? Are people not scared of England anymore? I don't think they are. No, I don't think they are. And you think, like Twickenham, what a stadium, what a massive, like huge place to go and play. And honestly, everyone I've heard that goes down there goes, oh, that's not, not a great atmosphere. So I don't know what it is. I mean, you look, they lost to the RGs, didn't they? They were 25-6 down against New Zealand at one point, 27-6 down against South, Af South Africa, oh, they're just not they're just not doing it. And I know everyone keeps harping on about the fans saying, oh, you know, we, we're giving up on it and, and talking about... It is the players as well. You've got to remember, everyone talks about Eddie Jones get, giving the sack, but like, the players have got to take a little bit on their shoulders, haven't they? Because they're the ones going out there. So is it the players or is it the game plan? And the other thing I need, I think people need to talk about more is, yeah, they always harp on about Eddie, but who's the defence coach, Matt? Do you know the defence coach? <laughs> <laughs> the defence coach is the problem. I mean, all I hear when people talk about it is the attack. Oh, the attack's failing. The attack's failing. You know? Yeah, I know. But I think if, the yeah, but the issue is... Sorry, what's that? Sorry, Max. I was just yeah. going to say, part of, part of the issue is that the sort of constant changing of backroom staff. Like defence is about exactly. systems, systems and a philosophy and the best teams defensively have had something in place and have had it in place for a while and they're sort of players in key positions that are kind of the leaders on the pitch. If that the issue for England is it, at times it, it feels if they're constantly changing coaches every 12 months or even less than that in some certain circumstances. So there's not that like continuity. Sorry, Max, I jumped in over the top. But is, yeah, but Matt, is that because of Eddie Jones? Is that because of these backroom stuff coming in and just because we heard a couple of stories last week from Joe Simpson saying... <laughs> I don't know if you heard it about the sausage and the steak story, but Sarah campaign. Yeah. It doesn't seem like the coaches get on that well with him. So is that Eddie Jones, maybe? Is that why that we're getting such a changeover there with, with the coaches from or you know what? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Is, is the honest answer. I've not been privy to probably to the, the intel that you guys might have in in terms of those conversations. But you know, clearly there must be something going on if you're if the if the international arena as a coach is the pinnacle of your career as it is as a player and you're kind of the arguably what well, the wealthiest union and one of the best unions probably to work for in the world if you're then choosing to move on or leave after a year you've got to probably look exactly. at what's going on yeah like what's gap let's let's just use our imaginations here let's use our gut <laughs> yes on what on what on what Joe Simpson gave us a little insight. We can only imagine that Eddie Jones, the grand architect, the magician of the mind, is um, just skull-fucking the coaches that he gets in. He wants to, like, scrutinise them and see what the devil they're about. He wants to test their metal. And, yeah, it, 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 does, it does seem bizarre, like, the amount of staff that go in and out of there. So that's true. And also, the attack. Like, if you're coughing the ball up that much, it doesn't matter how well you defend, you're gonna you're gonna concede points. So um before that was a big big problem is like the incoherent attack at the moment. Just like there's so many opportunities for opposition, like good opposition to to score points. 
Max, whilst we you're on that, I mean, we're, we're now basically just dissecting every bit of shit that England put out at the weekend. But, you know, the, the, the scrum was pretty feeble. The line out seemed pretty disastrous as well. You know, and what's weird, though, is you've got, I think I counted, what, six British and Irish Lions in that sort of starting eight. Mm. But nothing coming together. So, you know, is... <laughs> Players, coach, we we had Joe Simpson telling us that they are mentally shattered uh, coming off these these kind of England camps here. Where where does the buck stop? Well, yeah, we can't really question the talent, can we? Let's be honest. All those all that all that lot are are thirty. They're they're outrageous players. It's it's an unbelievable generation of talent for English rugby. So yeah, it would have to be what's going on in the hearts right now, the hearts and minds. Um, maybe they are a, a somewhat diminished spiritually as a team um they look slightly wayward like you could see as the um especially in the first half like how deep and like that south africa would like come in real high on the press with the d and then the back line were just getting deeper decoy runners just running 50 percent off ball and they weren't buying any of that um and even though there was some kind of endeavor to get the ball wide it just was never going to happen with any sort of real menace so yeah i think i'd say Coming back to your question, there'll be a battle of sort of, yeah, convictions at this point, maybe. Do they scrap Farrell and Marcus Smith? Oh, this is it, isn't it? I think that's everyone's throwing that out there. Um, do they scrap it? I reckon they just pick one, yeah, because and just go for a specialist 12 and just you go with that guy and he's your man for the World Cup and then you've got some coherency maybe. But oh, is, is it is that an easy thing to just blame it on that? I don't know. I don't know if it's that simple. We've got to try it. I'd have I'd have Farrell start at ten, Marcus Smith on the bench to bring on something special at the end. I concur with Ryan. I think um, I do think that kind of access is quite access is quite interesting with Smith and Farrell. It kind of feels as if it doesn't quite work. Um, and I, I, I agree with Ryan. I'd, I'd like to see Farrell start at 10 and I'd have Manu at 12 and Slade at 13. Just to give you those two pivots around a good a sort of bludgeoning ball carrier. Um, Manu sort of was not as effective over this series as he has been historically. And that, I, to be honest, that's part of a problem for England it appears with that backline attack that they're so reliant on him as an individual. And he's such a unique specimen of, a, of an athlete that you will always wait around for him and build a game plan around him. But the reality is that Manu's had a hell of a lot of injuries over the last last sort of five years or throughout his career, to be honest. And to build a game plan around one individual becomes very risky in the in the grand scheme of things. But I think if you can get somewhere in that in that midfield to give you the carry, or you can use use one of your wingers to cop the thing out maybe on the wing just to give you that punch. And I think a, a, a Farrell with a with a Slade axis right left foot kick as well gives you some nice balance to that midfield. What what was Tulagi Laggy like uh, to train with? I mean, he was great to train with. It was awful to play against. The, so I had the um, I played against him when he first burst on the scene at, uh, at Leicester. I was at Sale as a thirteen. I actually played with his brother in the midfield on the one game he played against him, Andy Tulagi himself was a big old unit, slightly less athletic and liked his alcohol a little bit more than Manu does. Um, but it was just it was, it was just awful, to be honest with you. It was one of those days where you try and just hold on to a leg and hope for the best or chewing gum chackle and try and fall with him. But he was just it's just so powerful. But then been in and around him, training with him, as is the case actually with a lot of the island boys in training, they take it easy unless you put a shot on them or not that I was ever putting a shot on anybody, given my physique. <laughs> Um, but if someone put a shot on them, they'd let you know not to ever do that again. But I always got on, yeah, absolutely fine with with Manu. We had sort of gentlemen's agreements around the, the contact side of things, and uh, I think what he doesn't necessarily get the he's a smarter footballer than people give him credit for. Um, he understands the game. He's not just this big bludgeoning weapon. He, he really does understand the game and he studies the game and he's a great guy to have around a, an environment as well. Have you ever seen him on the piss? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> oh, come on then. Right, here we go. <laughs> Back to that Unfortunately day. for you, Ryan, I'm one of the probably most boring rugby players you'll ever meet in terms of the social side of things. The irony <laughs> being that I'm organising a big social event, but um, he was always good fun. 
on the on the drink and he likes he likes a whiskey and coke oh is Whatever. that his that's his poison of choice is it whiskey and coke yeah i bet he gets fucking loose that gets you weird <laughs> whiskey and coke he sees stuff he sees stuff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was normally, honest, I was normally gone by that point. I'd always get my wife to go I'd dive into the car as it drove past the yeah. pub. And the Christian Bale. Yeah, exactly. The Batman Bob. Good work. <laughs> what um what have you got lined up for the boys after the, the sevens then? Have you got anywhere lined up for them to go on a good night out in Dubai? Have you organised that? Well, we, to be honest, we've got so much going on at the actual the event. We've got Gorgon City on the Friday night. Um, we've got Craig David presents TS5 on the uh, on the Saturday um, on our frequency on eight stage. So I'm doing my bit to plug it. Um, so post post the invitational tournament and the invitational tournament, the invitational tournament and the international tournament, there's there's, there's concerts on and music acts and everyone is encouraged to to sort of stay around. And that's sort of the beauty of what we've got here is it's actually your, your punters and athletes can kind of mingle and enjoy enjoy the festival experience. Yeah, that's why I think I would have enjoyed sevens being able to finish the tournament and have a beer with the fans. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, right? Let's come on. Let's keep plugging at the um at the the England South Africa game. Um, we've heard Matt on the best uh, com combination, but let's um quick word on the dominance of the box up front. You know, especially against what is, as as we've said, a, a very very high caliber England pack. Um, you know what 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 went so right for uh, for the Springboks, Max? Well, yeah, they had set piece parried, didn't they? they and they then they started to edge and edged into kind of sincere dominance in the second half. Um, well, they got mad depth there, but it's not just the it's not just the depth of talent. It's sort of that whole sort of um, the whole. Scrum as a as an organism for them is just they they feed off it massively emotionally, and uh, I think Fran uh, Malherb obviously got for the first penalty that England got uh, over the sticks. Um, that wasn't really a penalty for me. Malherb's just literally twisted up Mako like a pretzel, and he, it just sort of shows you the sort of power and dominance they can exert there. And I think they set their their stall out with that, um, and then in the second half with the changing of the, uh, the guard. Um, kits off, kits off really got weird and, and started started dominating quite 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 dramatically. Um, and um, but what was the answer to that? I think going in it looked as if uh, Will Stewart was heavily strapped already. He, he didn't have that strapping on against New Zealand, so sort of like his right leg might have been um, somewhat compromised. But um, they were sort of trying to load up. So, so on the, in the scrum as you're coming down. Sorry, lads, we're going to get weird for a moment. Scrum science. So as you come down, <laughs> the South Africa was sort of allowed, applying the pressure on the secondary, whereas England was sort of trying to dump the weight. And what was happening is they're getting so long out of their hips that they've got nowhere else to go when they go to shoot. But be that's because they were scared of the weight that was coming from South Africa. And then for those not watching, by the way, and listening, Max is pushing his fingers together. I yeah, yeah, and like the orchestration <laughs> of the front rows. And then South Africa took that and was just uh, burying, burying them on the engage. Um, that's my my scrum science for you. Rise, rise of master of the air, a real line out forward, a link, uh, a, a back rower. So um, yeah, but that that's where I saw that in terms of the the, the battle of the dark arts, if you like. They just got bullied all over the field, didn't they? Really, like that. The South African pack just absolutely dominated and left, right, and centre around the corner in the line out in the malls. Mm. You know what I mean? They just absolutely pummeled him. Malcolm Marks is so fucking good. And yeah, like, yeah, bring, yeah bring delightful to watch. <laughs> and then in England trying to replicate their bomb bomb squad, and it just went <laughs> downhill. Yeah. Didn't work. It's yeah. <laughs> You're really enjoying this, aren't you, Ralph? Well, no, no, no. I'm, not, I'm just. No, don't try it. Like it's all the Eddie thing, no, no, right, boys. You imagine him a week, right, guys? I've got my own ideas here. We're gonna have our own bomb squad, and then it just falling flat on its face. Yeah, well, it fucking didn't work, did it? Quick word on Kurtley Aronser, who's just the third Springbok to score in six consecutive tests. Danny Gerber and Chester Williams, the other ones, but I mean assessment. Of that try when I mean there's not a huge amount Marcus Smith could have done, but he was completely rinsed in that moment. 
Me and Max aren't allowed to comment on this. Well, yeah, yeah, man. Let's go. Let's go with somebody who's who, who's been in a situation <laughs> where skinning has happened and well, and has I've done been, the skinning. Well, more been skin normally. Um, no, I think it's what is what is quite nice, and I'd, I can't remember where I'd seen it referenced. Is obviously the Springboks are renowned for producing these huge human beings, but if you look at Chesley, Cheslin Colby, and currently Aaron's at the weekend. It's you've got these magicians. A lot of them started on the seven circuit. Get the plug in for the sevens on that. But it was just, it's great. Just to, it's it's just this sort of playing with that freedom, which is, at times I just wish. Like feels like the England wingers would do at times. We've got such talented wingers, and they're amazing at the kick chase side of things, which obviously drilled into them has been a big part of the, the kind of the tactical piece. But just have the freedom just to attack. <laughs> it's, it's what we all want to go and watch back three do. It's what you, as a back three player, thus you don't dream about chasing high balls like a Labrador chasing a chasing a tennis ball. You dream about getting the ball in hand and taking players on and doing what he did to Marcus Smith. And it was it was great great to see and. Hopefully, he's only a young guy. He's going to go on to be the next Cheslin Colby and sort of superstar. But you're saying yeah. that, right? That's what people want. People want to see really that. And the fact yeah, that the yeah. Twickenham crowd are booing, you know, at the final whistle. Right, let's hit it. You know, right. That's one win out of four this autumn for England. Five out of 12 in the year. Their worst run since 2008. The money that, you know, the RFU throws at the international game. That is not in anyone's books good enough to keep your job. You know what okay. the frustrating thing is that, and part of me is why I'm not. I don't want. To, I'm not necessarily been over exuberant in criticising. Is the thing is Eddie Jones is so is a smart coach. We could be having this conversation in nine months' time, <laughs> and they'll have got they'll have grand slammed the Six Nations, and they'll be one of the favourites to win win the World Cup. That's the bit that I. I still maybe maybe it's the English Englishman in me, Ryan. You can you can sort of tell me to shut up and talking talking rubbish. That's the bit I'm I'm reluctant to call for it. Uh, but yeah, Max, what's your what's your feeling on that? Is there still that element of it's going to come good? Well, hold I on, don't... didn't they finish in the last Six Nations just quickly? I, I'm not. That's not me trying to tear it up. Like, was it? Did they have a bad Six Nations? I can't remember. Yeah, they won. Yes. They they lost. They 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 came. Off, fourth, no, they, they could have come fifth. Yeah, they they. They lost three games, right? They is that right? Yes. Yeah, I think they did. Yeah, so they've had Amazing. a shock Six Nations. They've had a shocking yes. summer tour. I just made that up. <laughs> no, they didn't. It wasn't. Yeah, they beat Australia two one, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. But they've had a terrible autumn test, and are they going to struggle in Six Nations, Max? Would Georgia beat them? Yes. <laughs> oh, there you have it. <laughs> Well, no. What's the successful Six Nations for England? They have to win four games, don't they, really? Yeah. They have to. So they have to take yeah. two, two of the big dog scouts. We're talking about the two. Scotland like, and The two favourites of... What <laughs> oh, are you laughing at? I think Scotland will be tough, don't get me wrong. Fuck, you're not allowed to laugh Scotland, Scotland's no, stock is rising right now. But, First um, game yeah. as well. Scotland, Scotland, England down there at Twickenham as well. Oh, woof. It's going to be yummy. It's going to be very yummy. Scotland will smell blood. I mean, I mean on, on a separate note, how good is it for the World Cup, though? Looking forward oh, to 2023. So it's probably yeah. got so many teams now. Like we've not. It's, normally, we're talking about how good New Zealand are and that they're going to yeah. kill everybody. Are they going to choke it or not? New Zealand <laughs> yeah. You know what? I actually fancy Australia as an outsider as well. They get a few more of yeah. those players back. They've not been far off against all of the teams, including Ireland, who everyone's talking up as the been one of the favourites. So it's it's gonna it makes for it's gonna make for an amazing tournament, hopefully. Yeah, Matt, you you mentioned that you know there's this chance you've you've got that feeling within you that big Six Nations are then bang England back in at the World Cup next year, which is kind of exactly what Eddie Jones has been saying, right? He believes the team are building towards the World Cup, and that results don't matter which is kind of in any other business you know that's quite a convenient immeasurable kpi that you basically don't judge me on anything that's going bad just judge me on something that hasn't happened yet um do have we seen improvements over the last two three years i don't know whether we have have we um in fits and starts we've seen good performances but you could argue probably 2019 getting to the the final. Um, again, yeah, I'm trying to think of games 
post that we I, we've we've seen it in fits and starts. Um, but I guess that's the frustration as an England supporter. You have those glimmers of hope where it's it looks decent, but it's that consistency that's that's, that's been lacking. And the, the the excuse or the reason behind that's always been about blooding new talent and blooding new players and building those combinations. But yeah, things keep sort of switching around again. But that's not to say for the that he'll make his mind up post this and we'll see them consistency for the next 12 months. I guess that's maybe that's just the, the Patriot in me just clinging on to that. Max, gonna be are, all they right get, that. are they going to get rid of him, Max? Are they going to get rid of him? Before the World Cup. Before the World Cup, do you reckon he's getting the sack? No, he's done too much. He's got enough credit in the bank, I reckon. You reckon? Yeah. I don't think they'll get rid of him. But let's just, let's play, let's play in the hypothesis land, right? England's great. I'd say this is England's like England's greatest generation of talent. Like this, this, this is the crop that sort of won all the under twenties World Cups. It's outrageous. We've got freak shows all over the park. Depth like the Mariana Trench in all positions. Yeah, well, is is England? Yeah, no, you're going to be like, well, well, yeah, all right. Well, we'll just wait for wait for me to finish. Is England's success in spite of Eddie Jones or because of it? Dun dun dun. Does he does he just like grind them down to pulp and then it just goes and like fluctuates, or are they how much of the influences actually his? I don't know. That's what I try and figure out about these things, especially you, these like. You always pulp. get so deep. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I have to, I have to get <laughs> we got two Englishmen. You got Matt and Max. Do you think, <clears throat> would you get rid of him? I wouldn't. I think uh, to Max's point, I think he's got. Too much credit and credit in the bank. Um, yeah, I, 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 again, I'm just sort of clinging on that he's a great tactician, but <laughs> performances have got to improve. Um, and it's if you're going to do it, you're going to do it soon to give yourselves that sort of 10, 12 months leading into the World Cup. I don't think he will go there now. Matt, I get it. You're saying potentially you can see the same thing as 2019, you know, everything will come good. Max, you, you, you seem to sort of be more on the fence. Max, are you saying you think from all his results recently, he should keep his job? <laughs> Stop loading the dice, old bean. I hate to see it. So I see what you're up to, shuffling away on those cards. Um, no, I think, I think he stays in. I think he stays in. Why? Because he's done, he's done enough. He's, he's done... done he's, He's got a. He's got the best win rate with England that they've ever had. Before he's when? Before what? 2009. <laughs> but then the win, win yes. percentage. He is the man. He's the daddy. Is it not anymore? Has it gone down no, now? Not since post World Cup. He's at a 50 percent win success rate. Yeah, but but yeah, okay. I don't know how to explain my way out of that one. <laughs> 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 All I'm saying is. God, it's good we're not in the football, eh? Yeah. This is the this is the the chrysalid, you know, where they crush and change and there's a lot of scrutiny of the soul happening and then they, they flourish and persevere. Okay, oh. Matt, we're gonna start uh, again. I'm not this the, the, we're gonna go through all some of the wonderful moments and a lot of great things. I am gonna start at one that's not as fun, but don't worry, I've seen you're, I've, I've seen the script, so it's fine. I know where this is going. <laughs> Prepared. There's no script. There's no script to this. This is all no, the lads no. straight off the top of their heads. Yeah. This is off the dome, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you made your debut against Wales when you were 18. Give us a flavour of the memories of that day. Of course, especially the infamous Gavin Henson incident, which, which sadly passed for you, goes down as one of the most famous tackles in history. Yes. Thank you for reminding me of that. I've, uh, I've erased most memories with my counsellor, so uh, I can't really talk too much about it. No, it was, you know what, I was I was six months out of school. I look back now, I was there. six months prior to that, I was sitting my A-level. So it was all a bit bizarre. And there was the ignorance of youth to a certain extent. I, I hadn't actually bizarrely realised how big, a, how big an occasion it was probably going to be. Um, but that kind of, I'd gone from being, you're going to be on the bench to... We're thinking of starting you to you are starting um and you kind of just i just sort of took it in to be honest that week it was uh, i'd been quite diligent and boring as a schoolboy, so i i kind of that was part of the plan of kind of training and going through the academy and playing for newcastle and 
it was where I thought I sh- I, I, f- I wanted I always wanted to be um the build up to the week was just like any normal week to be honest um in terms of the training it was only when we were driving into the ground and you've got Welsh supporters kind of banging on the side of the bus and you go actually this is this is probably a little bit more hostile than I'd uh, I'd anticipated um and I guess the rest is history I got to get picked up by Mr Gavin Henson on a couple of occasions um and he it was sort of felt like it was written in the stars a little bit that day there was he put a couple of shots on the young upstart and he had a chance to kick the winning penalty and slotted it with his monster boot from about 50 meters out. And um, it sort of, it was what it was. Um, I mean, the crowning, the crowning turd in the water pipe to quote Blackadder was getting back to my parents' car and finding the, the back windscreen smashed out. We had a, a small St. George's cross on the bottom of the, uh, the registration plate, which some kind Welsh person had obviously taken exception to um, after a few too many beverages on the way to vodka revs and decided to uh, put their fist through the back windscreen. So that was dri- driving back to the Midlands with the kind of the fresh air blowing in through the uh, bin liner we'd put on the uh, the back windscreen was it topped the whole day off, shall we say? Introspectively, what was the fallout of that for yourself? Was it was it enough? Was it nothing, or was it significant? Like. Um, it was uh, it was it was tough to be honest. I found the week after tougher because um, I found out probably on sort of Tuesday, Wednesday, I wasn't going to be involved the following week, which was tough as someone that was. They felt all of a sudden, one week you were good enough, the next week you're not. As a, I literally just turned nineteen the day after. As as a young guy, was tough. Um, was I supported well? Not really, to be honest. By England at the time, I was kind of sent back to Newcastle and they brought me back down for the game randomly. They made me sit in a box. They're like, we want to keep you around for the game. So I sat in a box watching the French game. I think it was a week after. I think Ollie Barkley replaced me that day um, with, with Dave Olvid from memory, sat watching this game. I'm like, I want to be anywhere else on the planet apart from Twicken and watching this this French match. Um, and the fallout, I, I it, it did knock me for six a little bit to be honest just in terms of mentally it's it's such a big a big occasion it would have been something i've been building up and wanting to do my whole career and for it not to then turn out the way you necessarily anticipated it um i was really lucky at newcastle i had amazing support close family um and steve black um god rest his soul he was like this mentor and sort of just looked after looked after me when i came back him and Rob Andrew, I was really fortunate at the time, realised the value of the sevens to me, just kind of going, they sent me away to play on the seven circuit um, for, a, for a couple of tournaments, just realised the value and almost stepping up, stepping back from the pressure. The bit I enjoyed most about the game and the, the bit of the game I, was, I guess I was probably better at was the, the stepping and the running piece. And that's that's ultimately sevens in its purest form. It is it is one-on-one, it's taking taking people on and it was an opportunity for me to just go away and not fall in love, back in love with the game because it's too dramatic, but just kind of get back on the horse away from the the limelight, if you were. Talk to me a little bit more about Steve Black. I've heard so many good things about him. An absolute mm. legend of a bloke, like you said. Like, why was he so good? He was just like this oracle. He's, like, he, he had sleep apnea, so he didn't really sleep, but he just used to use that time to read. So he would just read books. He would just be so well informed about everything. And he was just this kind of big, larger than life character that genuinely, you knew he just genuinely cared about you. You come across coaches in, in your career and they go through the motions a little bit and it's one around the shoulder, but you know, it's a bit tokenistic. But with him, he genuinely cared about me as a person, about my family, about everything, about just you holistically as an individual. And like someone, he was so important to someone like Johnny and Johnny doesn't let people into that circle who he doesn't trust. And he was the ultimate to Blackie, um, to, to Johnny, sorry. And he's done the same with like Stuart Hogg's worked with him. Uh, yeah. Danny Cipriani's worked with him. These characters that have perhaps had their fingers burnt by trusting other people. They welcome, welcomed him in and just sought his advice. Like he'd had, he was a, kind of a bouncer in Newcastle. He'd lived a life before he became this sort of, most sort of personal trainer, guru, fitness expert. Um, so he, he had that experience as well, but he was just so well read and, and and just as most people from the northeast are, just the just kind of bubbly, kind of extrovert, really, really approachable bloke. 
Yeah, I've heard so much about him. That's one bloke I wish I had got to meet in terms of the rugby circles. He sounds like an absolute legend of a guy that I can did a lot for a lot of players, eh? So lucky to get to work yeah. with him, mate. Man. Yeah, no, incredibly, incredibly fortunate. But let's talk about some better days when you were back in the England team for that uh, infamous 2007 World Cup campaign. Uh, let's we'll, we'll we'll get to the final in a bit and um, and how brilliant you were there. But uh, firstly, take us to your memories of that meeting where the, the players kind of revolted against Brian Ashton after that that. Uh, thrashing at the hands of the, the Springboks? No, that's, that's a loaded question. He told you there was a meeting where everyone revolted. <laughs> uh, Cueto. Uh, yeah. Had, yeah. <laughs> it's been, don't worry, it's been, it's been on there. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily call it a revolt. The revolt sounds quite strong. It was uh, one thing about that squad, we were really fortunate. I mean, I was 21 at the time, but we had, a, an, say, an older, more experienced squad. So within that group, the likes of you, Mike Katz, Josh Lucy's, uh, Simon Shaw's, Johnny, guys that were captains at their clubs, but also had been involved in World Cup processes before. And they just knew, we obviously got pumped by South Africa, I think it was like 46 nil. Um, and it was post that, that these guys sort of, took the, they took the ball by the horns to a certain extent. And like, this is this is how we need to approach the game. These are, these are our strengths. Um, Let's just kind of really focus down and, and get a game plan that's that's going to work. And that, yeah, we, there was a, a meeting at the hotel opposite Versailles Palace where this sort of, yeah, I guess in, infamous meeting. I wouldn't necessarily call it call it a revolt, but it was that kind of set the blueprint for the for the rest of the tournament. And we did we play the most amazing rugby at times? Probably not. No, but we had a guy called Johnny Wilkinson at ten who was could kick a ball all right. Um, and a big, a big pack and experienced guys that knew how to knew how to win games and knew how to control games. Yeah, but you did. There were some, there were some good moments, and you know, obviously your incredible break in the final uh, to set up Mark Cueto for the try that never was. You know, fifteen years on, do you, do you think it was a try? <laughs> Although Cueto will argue till he's blue in the face that he definitely scored it. I, I mean, I. Again, as a proud Englishman, I have to be honest, I, I don't think it was a try. I think his foot was in touch. Um, I mean, the bigger question is, I got, I got tackled by Victor Matfield in the second row, just short of the line, which is slightly embarrassing. And to be honest, if I'd scored that, I could have retired and lived a rock star lifestyle and retired at 22. It would have been amazing. But um, again, like, even, even that game, I don't remember a, a sort of huge amount about the game. I, I remember the picking up the ball, I think it was Andy Gummersall kind of bobble pass and don't remember anything about the running, but getting it caught short by Victor Matfield and then Schalke Berger comes flying over the top and knees me in the head. So at that point, I'm, I mean, obviously now with the kind of concussion piece, I would have probably, that would have been my my final done at that point because I was I was a bit spaced out and all over the shot. Um, and you could argue he probably should have gone to the bin for that because it was those crucial couple of seconds that then allowed Danny Rousseau to kind of loop around the back of that defensive line to, to tackle Quates and Quates in the corner. Um, but it was, I was just, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience as a player, and um, it was a decent after party as well, <laughs> from what I can remember. Yeah, weren't well, there some famous faces in the changing room that night as well? Yeah, we had Prince. Prince Harry was was in there, and then randomly we ended up in some bar at the top of an Arc de Triomphe. I don't even know what it's called. Um, I think he ended up giving Toby Flood a love bite at one point on his neck. <laughs> which was, imagine trying to imagine trying to explain that one to his to his girlfriend. It was Prince Harry that gave me this. Yeah. Um, oh fuck. So it was, and then my my my, my girl, girlfriend at the time, wife now. I'd, I'd had a few too many drinks and we were kind of, as is with, with people of that stature, you kind of with them and then they've got their, you're there with you and then their security guards around the outside. And my wife came over and she was like, I'm with him, I'm with him. And I'd evidently turn around and go, I don't know who she is. I don't know who she is. <laughs> still, well, she Prince still Harry's hanging person. off your neck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well. I, actually think my I think my shirt was off at this point. It wasn't that long after that I got carted back to the, uh, to the hotel, draped over a security guard and put to bed. So, it was it was a good occasion. It was an amazing occasion. It was sort of let your hair down moment and enjoy what was a 
a kind of a bit of a, a bit of a journey. I mean, the best game in the whole tournament, to be honest, was the the Australia game down in down in Marseille, because we kind of we'd gone down there with no expectations. We got to the quarterfinals. The Aussies were like fully loaded. Their team on the day was like ridiculous, um, and we ended up like we we turned them over. It was Andrew Sheridan killed Matt Dunning that day. Just sort of turned into the incredible Hulk. Sterling Mortlock missed that kind of kick late on. But we'd got to the hotel like with the week sort of leading up to the game and it was the thing the Georgians had just left the hotel it hadn't been cleaned probably it was like vom- vomit all over the sinks it looked like there'd been a stag do one of the players is sort of, he sort of, he sort of phoned his daughter had phoned him and he said you know don't worry I, I might be home on Tuesday so there was kind of this there wasn't necessarily the expectations we knew within the group we had the capabilities to beat them but we were sort of relieved of any expectations at the time and uh yeah, to beat them and then get on the bus and then the French were doing their thing in Cardiff against New Zealand. It was, it felt like it was almost written in the stars a little bit that our luck had, our luck had turned at that point. Quick one on that break though. What did you think at one point were you like, I'm going to make this? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I didn't necessarily think I would. I, I think I got past, I think it was either Percy Montgomery or, Brian Habana and I could see kind of daylight um, and then Victor Matfield caught me. So fair play to him, caught by a second row. Uh, just a quick one. I mean, you were, as you said, you were only 21 at the time. You ended up only making, I think, probably five more starts for England and, and not many more after you were 24. Do you think, have, have you sort of made sense of, of why that is and, and why, you know, you didn't end up perhaps fulfilling or reaching that, international level potential for longer yeah i don't know i, mean, I remember actually after the final we did, I did an interview me and toby flood were kind of doing the the mingle post and people were asking us about the disappointment of not winning and i was like i'd be fine you know just going to spur me on for four years time not knowing that i would never get an opportunity to sort of do it again um sort of a, yeah, a lesson in making the most of opportunities when you have them but um ultimately the, the accountability sits with me you don't the I was unlucky with injuries at times when I was sort of playing some decent rugby at Leicester at that time, but there was good players um, in those positions. I kind of transitioned a little bit more to to fullback by the time I'd gone to Leicester and moved from moved from the centres. But ultimately, if you don't get you don't get picked, it's because you're not playing well enough, and that ultimately sits with me. So I'm um, I'm at peace with that to an extent. Could I could I have done any more? I don't think so. I used to train as hard as as anyone. Um, but ultimately, if you don't get picked, it's because you're not good enough at the time, and there's better people people available, and just kind of crack on with it. Um, no bad blood with how you were handled by Andy Robinson at the time, or any of the sort of subsequent coaches. Um, I mean, would I have liked them to have done it differently? Yes, but sort of, I guess been more supportive. And if you're ultimately, if you're good enough for one week, you, you're good enough the second week. Apart from the two tackles, I actually didn't think I'd played that badly, to be honest, on the day. But it kind of is, it is what it is. And, you know, ultimately, Robbo makes the decisions in the best interests of the team. And if it's dropping me, he was vindicated because they beat France the following week. So it's kind of, would I have wanted it to be handled differently? Absolutely. But it is, it is what it is, to, to quote Richard Cockrell. Um, Matt, over your career, did you find your sort of emotional investment um, into the game waned or waxed or um, like post certain events? Just uh, just a general question. I'm just intrigued. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I th- it did towards probably the, the last 18 months, if I'm honest. Like I've yeah. always been like committed to, wholly committed. And I, I still was towards the end, but I think if you do something for long enough, I, you, and I, I struggled a bit with injuries and you get to a point at times where the body doesn't necessarily react as quickly as the mind wants it to or it used to. And that comes with, creates a lot of frustration as well. Um, so t- towards the end, it become, I found it more of a mental battle than a physical battle at times. Um, but did, did it wane? I, I don't know. I was still, I was, I was still as diligent in terms of the training and, and stuff that I was doing. It just became more of a mental effort to kind of stay on top and remain that level of, maintain that level of diligence. And you had yeah. kids by the end. Yeah, so I've got a seven and a nine-year-old. So yeah, but I, mean, I had kids. So when we were in the prem, 2012, 13, 
I'd had my first first kid just after that. And actually, I probably I was due to go to Bayonne. I'd signed for Bayonne, um, and I, that was sort of that season. I, I sort of played some of my best rugby, if I'm if I'm honest. Um, and that didn't work out for various different reasons. They got relegated. My wife wasn't very well post our second child, so it's sort of those sliding door moments where, from a from a lifestyle and just an experience point of view, it had been amazing. What an amazing part of the world it is down there. Um, I mean, the top 14, I think, can be a bit of a wild west in terms of what's going on. Um, but it's uh, you know, ultimately, at least a believer in things, things happen for a reason. And I stayed and various things happened with Leicester and with life and, and all the rest of it. I've got to be a little bit philosophical about it. Yeah, just- that's right. I like that. You're a, are you a solipist then? What sort of philosopher would you say you are? <laughs> <laughs> An idealist. What is- An idealist. Probably... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I am. I can't think of any off the top of my head. It's it's ten, oh, it's ten o'clock here. It's been a long day. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Yeah. I love that you're going on that. Whereas Ryan was still thinking of uh, oh the, the dollars for that season you would have got oh, a buy on. Yeah, but no, you're right though. Buy on. Oh, what a place. Yeah. Place to live. Beautiful. But it was it was the time they were they were talking about merging as well. And I mean, not that they ever will, just because of the the rivalry between the two. But imagine a super club down in that. That region, if they both merged and just the lifestyle, yeah, that's standing. Yeah. Now, I was more asking the question about the kids because just I've found it that it's just hard work juggling rugby and kids, especially when you've got four of them. Yeah. Idiot. No, I, I haven't got four, and I that's been taken care of, so there won't definitely won't be four. Um, I uh, yeah, I don't know. I. Did it change me? I was I was actually studying as well towards the last couple of years, so I was kind of was conscious of trying to just be busy around outside of rugby. There's more to life than rugby, and it probably took me too long to be real, realize that. To me. So I did a master's in sports directorship, is what I did. Oh yeah, um, the last couple of years, and I was yeah looking at private equity and sport. If you if you want if you're struggling to sleep, I've got my uh, master's dissertation on that. Can be. Private equity. <laughs> oh, I've read it. Yeah. <laughs> Just take us back. You mentioned it, the, the 2013 Prem final for Leicester. Uh, how incredible was that <clears throat> moment for you on and off the pitch? Well, it's ultimately what you kind of aspire to is, is the pinnacle of, of, the, of the club game is to, to win, win your domestic league and to win Europe. Unfortunately, never got to semi-finals in Europe and never got a chance to win that. So from the, from the club point of view, to be able to to win the league with with Leicester and um, played a reasonably prominent part across that season to or re- reasonable contribution across that season to us getting there as well. Um, and it's always nice to beat your your local rivals um, down at down at Twickenham. Um, and we'd lost the previous year to Harlequins, I think. Um, I think it's Harlequins. And um, I'd, I'd I'd struggled, so I went to Leicester with a dislocated shoulder for my time at Sale. Had a great pre-season, and then the week before the first first Premiership game against Exeter, I had this like pop in my groin. So basically, the joint just above your old fella, and I, I basically got oste- osteitis pubis, um, which yeah. then kept me out of action pretty much. That it was that entire first season at Leicester. So I, the the year we won the league was sort of my my real first season of playing a full season for Leicester having kind of been this spare part, kind of wandering wandering around with this groin that wouldn't fix itself. And actually, I got to a point about two-thirds through that where I just wondered whether I wasn't ever going to recover from it. Um, you know, we're sort of nine, nine, six, seven months into this recovery process from double hernia up, and then I had sclerosing injections into the joint. And then it turned out one of the meshes from the hernia had moved, so I had to go in for a second repair on that. It was just as much a mental... <laughs> a mental head fuck as, as, as anything else to be perfectly honest um so that was it was that was sort of extra special winning winning the league that next season to play a prominent role but obviously on, on the back of had such a such a difficult period and i'll always be grateful for leicester for, for sticking by me i know kind of on the back of covid there were lots of guys that were had salaries re- reduced and, and let go i was very fortunate leicester that time obviously in a, in a very different financial environment but they, they could have got rid of me at the end of that first year if they really wanted to on, on the basis of what, what the contracts were, but they 
they stuck by me, sort of Simon Cohen, Matt O'Connor, and Richard Cockrell, and I'll be I'll be eternally grateful for them for doing that. Um, you just a, qu a quick few more just to uh, to finish off, but a quick word on your you made your debut for Newcastle pre leaving school, um, scoring was it with your first touch of the ball as well? Yeah, yeah, first, yeah, I think so. Yeah, guilty. Uh, <laughs> you got you got me. <laughs> thanks for sending that thanks for sending that in though Matt but you were playing alongside uh, you mentioned him a, a bit Johnny Wilkinson for, for all those years in the northeast uh, what were, yeah did, did, many nights out with him was he good value I couldn't keep him off the quayside to be honest he was always down there nah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, funnily enough there wasn't too many nights out um, but he was like I was again, I was sort of you look back and realize how fortunate I had. There was Johnny and there's a guy called Matt Burke as well. Um, the great Australian fullback, and they were both just up, just both legends of blokes, guys that had done everything in the game, albeit different age spectrums, but would just have time for you as this young 18 year old coming through the, the stay around after training to kick or to tackle or just let you pick, pick their brains. Berkey, me and Lee Dixon, the, the, the nine um, England scrum half of, of Saints, was in Newcastle with me at the same time. And Berkey used to get us over to to his house for for food and stuff. So just so fortunate to have mentors like like the pair of them um, to take us under their wing. You at Sale, you were playing alongside Luke McAllister. How how good value was he in Manchester on a night out? And was, and also was he one of the best players you've ever played with? He had the world's biggest quads. That's what I can oh. remember about him. And they were to die for as well. They were sort of just used to glisten. Um, he, he was How big is his penis, honest, yeah. though? <laughs> uh, I didn't see that, actually. Right <laughs> um, so, again, going, going up there, the first year at Sale, there was Luke McAllister, Charlie Hodgson, Richard Wiggles was still there. Dwayne Peel signed the same time as me. You've got Chabal, Lobe, Jason, Jason White. It was this like, Jared and Bruno. An unbelievable team. Nuts. Um, <laughs> It was incredible, but yeah, Luke was great, um, great to play with. I mean, he was again a young guy that sort of burst on the scene with the All Blacks, had the skills to pay the bills, but just just physical with it as well. Um, and as I referred to earlier, I am probably the most boring rugby player you'll ever meet, so I didn't have too many nights out on in Manchester with him. But I understand he was good value. Again, I'll sit on the fence without, yeah, without giving any details away. He was good value on the on the night out. Um, let's just do well. Let's go with the quick fire now, uh, and get your uh, first first thing that comes into your head. Best player you've ever played against? Manu Tuilangi. Okay, you can't pick him as well, but best player you've played with? Um, oh, I'd have to say uh, jo Johnny. Biggest fight you've witnessed in training? Oh, uh, I don't know who it involved, but it was a Leicester on a Tuesday whilst we were kicking balls around. They were kicking lumps out of each other in their forward session. Probably it'd be Lewis Deacon will have been involved in some capacity, I would imagine. Worst enemy in rugby? Oh, worst enemy? Man, I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So, um, Henson? Yeah, let's we'll go with that because that's 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 an easy yeah for ruining my life. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, <that's all>. yeah. <laughs> I don't I didn't have any oh I suppose the guy who ruined my life, I suppose I'll go with him. <laughs> and finally, who are you taking with you? Three players for the ultimate night out in a cab with you. Oh man. Um uh, one one lobby. Um, oh man, you put me on the spot here. Um, trying to think from the Leicester days, Jeff Parling, just because he's a good friend and he's as boring as me, but he's quite good fun when he's had a drink. And and and, and Johnny, because we can be boring together. <laughs> and he'll get you in places as well. And he'll get exactly get VIP everywhere. Cool. Okay, brilliant. Well. Um... Matt, thank you so much uh, for your time and a huge thanks as always to Ryan and Max as well and to you all for listening and watching and we'll see you all next week.